Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. It's a cold, dreary morning in December of 1945. A dark green Cadillac limousine with trumpet-like horns on the hood and large white stars on its doors has pulled out from a narrow street in Bad Naham, that's occupied Germany. And it's begun what would be the fateful last ride for one General George S. Patton, Jr. At that time, he's the highest-ranking American officer in Europe and America's greatest, quote-unquote, fighting general. What exactly would happen on that car trip remains a mystery to this day. Key witnesses have disappeared, records are missing, contradictions and questions abound. Not only did Patton have a dramatic impact on World War II, he's also an American legend who might have shortened or even prevented the Cold War, America's longest and most damaging conflict, had he only survived. Those words there from Robert Wilcox and his book Target Patton, The Plot to Assassinate uh, General George S. Patton, and that's actually going to be our topic today, is old blood and guts, as uh, he's sometimes known, uh, I guess, by the soldiers and by the media as well. Uh, but our departure in um, on our episode today is going to be, what would have happened if George Patton had survived um, the injuries that resulted from that fateful car crash in December of 1945? And as a result of that, would have had other options upon his return to civilian life back in the United States, including potentially entering into politics. Hi, I'm Don Shelley. Welcome to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Happy to be joined today by a guest co-host. That's one Dean Rogers. Dean's a friend of mine and is uh, much like me, a history buff, so a great candidate uh, <laughs> to join the podcast today and also particularly with an interest in military history. Dean, thanks for being part of the podcast today. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. I uh, I do love history. Uh, it's probably the thing I read the most, just for pleasure, and I love the idea of the what if scenarios. Yeah, I, th- I think counterfactuals and what ifs are fun. I know for me, it's a little bit like uh, when you learn another language, you learn your own language better. Sure. And I think it's mm-hmm. true that when you think about what could have happened, you have a better appreciation for what actually did happen because you're able to put it in a context that is a context all of a sudden. Uh, about the other possibilities that are there. Absolutely. So Dean was actually one of the first people to reach out to me after we launched the podcast and give me some encouraging words, so I think that. And so I told him right then and there, well, you understand by, that by doing that, you have now nominated yourself at some point <laughs> to be a guest host. And so he's here joining us today, and this topic is his suggestion. So even though I'm sort of leading, leading the charge here just from famili- familiarity, uh, I'm going to be relying upon Dean a great deal to talk about this scenario. And I think your mo- your motivation or part of your inspiration for this actually w- was some of the reading that you've done, right? Correct. I was uh, I had just finished uh, Killing Patton by um, Bill O'Reilly. Uh, it was um, a really good read, interesting. Uh, but it ended with the idea of uh, that apparently, and I didn't even realize this, that that it's been around for years and years, this idea that Patton didn't just die from injuries in the car accident, but was actually the target of an assassination. Okay. And um, while Riley's book gets into just the tip of that, the Wilcox book, which I haven't finished yet, uh, goes in much more detail about the, the assassination plot. Okay. And so the uh, the way that we're going to we'll always look for our fork in time sure. where history is going to depart is we're going to assume that whether it was an accident or maybe something more devious, uh, Patton survives this incident and thus does return to the United States and, and, a, and a civilian life and has the chance to enter politics. And thinking uh, part of it as we think through the alternate history there, it's why would somebody even want to kill George Patton, right? Why, well, that that's it right there. You. you in order to, to come up with the, the fork in time sort of scenario, uh, you would ha- you have to first accept that maybe somebody wanted him gone, and if so, why? And if through finding those for those reasons, you can kind of come up with what might have happened had he not survived. You know, those reasons were, were fairly political at the time. Right. So as a starting point, uh, most people probably, in fact, we were talking about this before we began recording. If I say 
George Patton or General Patton, the first thing that pops into my head <laughs> is not uh, the image that I actually have on my computer screen, which is a picture of the real George Patton. Uh, but what I see in my head is I see George C. Scott as Absolutely. General George S. Patton. George C. Scott is Patton. That's it, just it. Yeah, in <laughs> fact, I can't help but think about the opening opening scene where he's in front of the large American flag and he's, in theory, addressing troops and, and the things that are there, which is based upon a real-life speech that he delivered. Right. He, he, it was his real speech to the Third Army before they shot out again, across France. Yeah. So I, I think for most people, their familiarity with Patton would be uh, would be the movie. Uh, which for which Scott won an Oscar that he never claimed. That's a whole interesting thing that you can also get into there as well. Uh, but one of the things I know that you see from the movie, in addition to telling the military, the role that Patton played in the Second World War as a military commander, which is obviously well documented in the movie, you also the movie is about showing something of his personality and his character, and he had definitely had he definitely got a personality. Personality, yes, yes. Uh, which would which would be interesting had he survived, which we'll get into. Right. Uh, I did discover some things I did not know about Patton, and I thought I knew most of what there was to know about Patton. I certainly knew about his uh, his famous revolvers. I certainly knew about the incidents that are documented in the movie, his clashes with uh, senior leadership right. in, in, in the Allied command structure, uh, uh, some of those because of his aggressiveness versus their passiveness or the political considerations that had to be there. But what I absolutely did not know was that we could have, we also be talking about uh, General George Patton, Olympic medalist. Olympic medalist, yes. Yeah, I, I was, it was interesting to me to find out that he participated in the 1912 Olympics. The Olympics are still very new at that time, and so I guess that's the 20th year since yeah. the, the reconception in 1896. And in fact, in 1912, a new event was added, that's the modern pentathlon, which was built around this idea of the skills of a quote-unquote modern soldier right. so riding a horse uh, fencing uh, shooting shooting pistols a, a running element there a swimming element was there in fact I, I think that my understanding the idea behind the pentathlon is it's like a soldier that's escaped from captivity that's trying to find Survive. his way back mm -hmm. so you ride a horse you, you swim a creek you, you shoot some guns and you fight somebody with the sword uh, to get what's there and also I discovered that Patton was apparently quite the swordsman actually designed a sword and he did he he designed the what became the 1913 cavalry saber yeah and so this idea you know it's also <clears> interesting <throat> thinking back to the movie there he talks about you know he, he overlaps that period before as tanks tanks eventually become modern cavalry but he overlaps the the end of the period where horses were actually used in warfare and the old ideas about what it meant to be a, a soldier or a cavalry a cavalry right. officer yeah and so that's there as well that's actually how he uh first sort of arrives in the american consciousness is um on the back of horses chasing pancho villa in mexico in 1914 um it was his group his under his leadership that they never c caught pancho villa but they took out a lot of his supporters a lot of his men that were like close associates and he made the news, and it was also sort of just to tag in there that that it was the end of an era. He also gets the um, the notoriety for being the first person to use automobiles in combat. So, uh, and that was during his Pancho Villa chase. <laughs> so, so the beginning of what we think of as being modern mechanized mechanized warfare, right? Yeah. After that, he was sent in 1917 to France under Pershing and uh, kind of spearheaded the whole tanks in yeah. combat, and, and for those which of us, was a big deal in the last year of the war. Yeah, it, it changed the outcome of the war. It broke yeah. through this idea of, of a stalemated trench warfare by suddenly this technology altered. A lot, technology altered that war in a lot of ways, the chemical weapons, right. tanks. Uh, and and it, it, you know, one of the amazing things to me is somebody who's you know, looked at military history has always been drawn to that is uh, it's only 25 years of time basically there between the, the interwar period, the end of the war, the beginning of the next war. But there's a lot of technology that changes during that period of time and warfare changes pretty dramatically as a result of that. Right. And warfare itself, you know, just sort of accelerates technological advances and World War Two, especially we right. can see that. Right. Um, so the the patent that we know, the real patent from history, uh, 
uh, dies uh, shortly after the um, that, that crash in 1945. So that's only approximately six months removed from the end of the war in Europe. It's only three months removed from the end of the war in the Pacific. So this is very much the immediate aftermath of World War II, Allied occupation in Europe, uh, which uh, Patton and others are, are are involved in because the military is still there. So we haven't seen the full demobilization from the war in quite the way that it will be shortly after that at the time that Patton exits the stage. Right. Patton um, actually, and a lot of people don't know this, he got fired as the um, the general in charge of the Third Army after he had done all this heroics leading the um, the Third Army across Europe and basically winning the Battle of the Bulge and capturing all this territory. Um, he had done some things that kind of uh, riled the Allies and went up the chain of command. And Eisenhower, who kind of always walked a, a tightrope with, with Patton because he knew he needed a general like Patton, but Patton also came with a lot of baggage, finally had had enough and took his command away that he dearly loved. And um, also, at the same time, Patton realized he wasn't going to get a Pacific command. And instead, he gets put in charge of basically um, being the military governor of Bavaria, a job that he would hate. Yeah. And I think intentionally, and they intentionally knew that he would hate. So the other thing I think that a lot of people don't realize, I think I, this was actually referenced in the recent episode, uh, if D-Day had turned out differently, where I was, we were talking about, you know, a lot of people forget is, yes, we were allies. We were allies with the Soviets. Uh, we may slip in occasionally here and call them the Russians. We both know the appropriate <laughs> term to describe them as the Soviets. And I, as somebody who has a degree in political science, I try to be sensitive to that, but also catch myself because the world changed also here in the last right. 20 years. It changed back. It changed so. back, yeah. So it, it, sometimes I catch myself between those two things. So even though we're allies, we are also in competition with these allies, particularly over, in fact, there was the race to Berlin that happens late in the war, which is which? how far were the Soviet troops going to come from the east moving west, allied troops moving from the west to the east. And one of the things that, that, that Patton got a little bit crosswise with, with command was he wanted to push as far and as fast as he could uh, so much so running out of resources and sometimes with tank forces to be able to go as fast and far as they want to. Well, uh, yeah, a lot of hist uh, history uh, says that he ran out of resources, but if you really look into it, and historians are now you know, being a little more open and honest about things, uh, it wasn't that he ran out of resources, is that Eisenhower cut him off. Right. Uh, because Patton left to his own devices would have gone into Czechoslovakia, liberated Prague, and then moved on to Berlin. And back at Yalta, it had already been decided that Czechoslovakia and, and the Berlin, the city of Berlin itself, would be left to the Russians, oh, the Soviets, <laughs> say he did it already. Yeah. Um, and, and, of course, Patton, you know, thought that was ridiculous because the longer you drag out a war, the more people are dying. And he was... He kind of has this uh, dichotomy of thought as a, as a military mind. He's this sort of elitist uh, American, born into a rich family, you know, best education, and you know, f learns f uh, fencing in France and all this kind of stuff. But at the same time, he really cared honestly about the the, the grunt, the, the the ground pounders. And the idea that the higher generals, the high command, was literally prolonging the war and killing more Americans and more British just so that, you know, Montgomery could do this or Zukov could do that made no sense to him. Right. So he, he was, yeah, fit to be tied, I think would be the expression. Yeah, so, so, the, so the, this, this tension that existed between the political considerations of the war, the military considerations of the war, it's actually probably a good place for us to jump off into what we're talking about as being the fork in time. The alternative here is that as, as a general, he, he was struggling with the politics. And so the question then is raised if he comes back after being a general, he enters the American political scene. We'll talk about under the scenarios that that might right. have happened. How might that have played out? Because um, he had a disdain, to some degree, for 
politics for the sake of politics. More of a more of a straightforward thinking things through from a pragmatic standpoint versus a political standpoint. I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a on a on a limb politically here. Um, I think uh, in, in doing the reading that I've done on Patton, uh, he strikes me as being very similar to our current president. He he says things often uh, in his career to the press to his own soldiers without thinking about political repercussions. He says things in colorful ways, using colorful language that most Americans would be offended by at that time, I think. Uh, but he's kind of, a, in his mind, a straight shooter. And um, that doesn't always work in politics. Sometimes, obviously, looking at America today, it can work. But um, at his time, in his day... Certainly, the the people in political power above him didn't like it, right? And that that's kind of the important thing. Um, as his in his position of of governor, which he despised, also he um, got in a lot of trouble for putting uh, former Nazis into positions of authority in the new German government. Um, America had agreed politically to a complete denox, denazification of Germany, and um, certainly the then uh, vice president Henry Wallace was all you know for that. Or actually, the former vice president, forty-five, um, he wanted no Nazis. He hated Nazis. Uh, the Roosevelt regime wanted it that way. Truman just pretty much continued what he inherited. And um, so we have uh, Patton there putting Nazis into power. That really rubbed everybody wrong. He, of course, got called on the carpet for that. And, um, and the, I know his rationale behind that was he needed people who knew how to do the jobs that were needed there. And in many cases, these folks had probably not actually been supporters philosophically of the things that we obviously, for all good, for all good reasons, we know why we oppose things the Nazis did, but it was just one of those things that people went along because that's what you had to do in, in a country that was in strife and a country with, that was at war. Sure. I, I, I kind of liken his argument to um, when I was much younger, I lived in Panama City, Florida. And... In Panama City, Florida, you had to be a Democrat to participate in elections because there was no Republican Party to speak of. Um, there, if whoever ran for sheriff, for instance, would be a Democrat, and so there was no general election, and they had closed primaries, so everything's decided in the the Democratic primary, and uh, they would they would get the nomination, and of course they would be unopposed by Republicans and they would just automatically get it. So in order to vote and have a say in your local government, you had to register as a Democrat. Uh, that didn't mean that you believed in everything the Democratic Party was, you know, dishing out. You just wanted to vote for sheriff, you know. Right. So, uh, and that's sort of what Patton says about the Nazis is that, you know, in order to get anywhere in, in, in the 30s in Nazi Germany, you pretty much had to be a member of the party. And that just meant that you joined the party. Yeah, you probably, you know, had some sort of oath that you took. But that doesn't mean that you were, like, you know, pushing bodies into the furnaces. You, know, right. you could have just been a clerk somewhere doing a menial job, not even involved in politics and be apolitical. Right. And But yet have those jobs and understand how things need to work to make the buses run on time. Um and so he, it didn't make sense for him to tie up, what he said, to tie up soldiers to do these jobs when you had somebody who was an expert in the, in the field who wasn't, you know, in charge of any of the horrors of the Nazis, and they could do it better and more efficiently. Plus it was their, I think his argument, I've heard him, it was their country. And it was their country, you know, they, of course they should be rebuilding it. Things that we've heard. Uh, in the last 20 years about, you know, Iraq and, and other countries. Right. Yeah. Same sort of criticism. It, it's interesting how history 
there's an old adage about how history repeats itself because history tends to repeat itself. Well, the the first part of that adage is if you don't learn from history, right, it tends to repeat itself, and I just think it it goes to show that we haven't. Okay, so I know that there were two scenarios you, we were talking about here off my before. Um, one one of them is 1948. So why, yeah, why don't so, we focus on that? So assuming that he survives now. He, you kind of have to get into why they wanted to assassinate him in the first place. Um, if you're, you know, yes, he maybe maybe he wasn't even assassinated. I mean, that, there is that side of it. Um, certainly, I believe that most of my life. I thought he just died in a car accident. Um, but assuming that someone would want him assassinated, it, it begs the question why. Um, of course, he was outspoken. We've covered that. He placed the Nazis. We got that. He also hated the press. He was very vocal about the press being the enemy. Um, and just like in today's society, you know, the press uh, can kind of push public opinion in the direction that they want. So this was not good for somebody uh, that represented the administration to be anti-press. Uh, they, he questioned the, the decisions of his superiors all the time. And, of course, his open and, and vehement hatred of the Soviets and all things communist. Um, and there are two, two scenarios for the assassination. But um, suffice it to say that they both are happening for the same reason. Um, one scenario is that he was assassinated by members of our own government. And the other one is that the Soviets took him out. And there seems to be a lot of evidence for the Soviet connection. Um, on the day, let's see, on the, um, there's this, this man named Skubik, Stephen Skubik. Um, he's a CIC agent attached to Patton's army uh, while he's in Germany. And that's basically your chief uh, intelligence officer. And there are three different people in different occasions reported to this man that the Soviets wanted him silenced and wanted him killed because of his desire to push the war and basically openly say that what we need to do is go in and fight the Soviets right now before they get stronger. And um, so right away, one of the things that obviously would be different is the idea that maybe there would be a hot conflict with the Soviets and Europe. Uh, but before uh, 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 immediately after what we think it was being the end of the war, so we're talking well, f f late he would have early to, 46, something like that. He wanted it in that in that time period. That's that's what he wanted. That's what he envisioned would be right. Now I don't think there's any political will for that, especially you know in Europe. Um, Europe had already been ravaged by World War II, and at home in America, uh, the party in power was very liberal. Uh, you had many members of the Roosevelt uh, regime still in power that that lauded the, the Soviet system and, and liked a lot of the things they did and didn't understand the criticism. And one thing we talked about before uh, recording was that in the 1920s and 1930s, there was a huge movement in this country uh, building of the Communist Party. And uh, it's kind of we kind of forget about that because of the Cold War and, you know, my generation certainly being born after uh, McCarthyism and all, you just accept that communism is bad and that communists are bad. But it's very possible that we could have gone a different route uh, had uh, the liberals stayed in power, remained, remained in power in this country. So there's a, a strong sympathy for, for the Soviet Union all that they endured during the war. So there's no real political will for him to push his war agenda before 48. So the the scenario is him running for office and why why would he run for office? He um he had already decided pretty much that he wanted to uh resign from the army, which is kind of unusual. It, it makes a a, a point that he's wanting to do something big because he could have retired and had benefits, but he didn't need the money. He was independently wealthy and married into money too. 
So instead of retiring and keeping those ties to the military and to the government, he wanted to make a point of resigning so that he could speak his mind. And he said to his aide that he has secrets that need to be told. Um, you know, anytime somebody says that they have secrets that need to be told and then they die under suspicious <laughs> circumstances, it's going to give rise to you know conspiracy theories. But some of those secrets were no doubt how Eisenhower, for political reasons, prolonged the war and, and got people killed that didn't. You know, very mudslinging kind of things. Um, but um, there were a lot of things that, that he would have done differently had he been president. Um, but that's not until 1948. There's a lot of things that happened between then that is going to in, interfere or change the world. We have Churchill, of course, giving his um, Iron Curtain, Curtain speech in, in uh, 47, I think it is. Correct. And uh, the Marshall Plan, I think you mentioned earlier, um, that rebuilding, reconstructing Europe, um, new currency in Germany, th which leads to the Berlin blockade. And uh, we counter with the airlift, and there's all these, you know, international political moves. Uh, and on 12 March of 1947, Truman comes out with the Truman doc Doctrine, saying that we're going to give aid to any country that requests it to resist communism. Um, this is certainly a departure from Roosevelt. Um, and then at the time, I think Truman meant it for Europe. Um, it wasn't necessarily a global thing uh, because the conflicts at that time were basically in the Balkans and then in Greece. Right. And um, there, there's the Security Act, and this is kind of important. <clears throat> the Security Act of 1947 gave the power of uh, gave power to the president um, to use the military in ways he had never been able to do it before. Uh, before the Wars Powers Act uh, that happened, what, about 40 years ago. This was like the first one of those. Um, and it also creates the CIA. Which had been during the war, the OSS. Right. And, and it had existed, but not in the kind way that of. we think of the modern intelligence apparatus. Separate from, separate the, from the military. From a military intelligence right. apparatus, right. And then the, the, in 1948, there's a communist... Uh, coup in Czechoslovakia. All of this showing that the the tensions with the communists are right there then, right? What we think 40, of as being the Cold War, this was the start of the Cold War. There was a good reason there was a Cold War. There were tensions. In fact, the tensions right. were there between the Allies at the end of World War II and they're now building and morphing post-war and what's going on in the post-war world. Yeah, I think it's pretty clear by, by Churchill's speech in forty seven that we're no longer allies with the Soviet Union. <laughs> right. Um, the other thing to, to note is that we established the, or we didn't, but we did kind of, uh, established the nation of Israel in May of 1948. Right. Um, U.S. was the first to recognize Israel. Um, we kind of pushed it through the U.N. as one of the first things the U.N. did. So that all of that's the political... Um, environment in which the 1948 election is going to take place. And if Patton's alive during that, and people who were supporting him in 45 to make a run are convincing him to run, it makes for a very interesting alternate history uh, scenario. For, for a guy who was already <clears throat> thinking about running to be approached and to be... Um drafted right. <laughs> as a candidate per se. We were talking a little bit off mic beforehand. This is, you know, this exists throughout this exists throughout world history. It certainly exists throughout American history. Look at looking back at the number of presidents that occupied the Oval Office that were generals just about a decade or two before. Grant, you know, look you know, Eisenhower later. Eisenhower. This pattern Washington, Washington this pattern exists Jackson, this pattern Jackson. exists of uh uh one way to achieve national prominence is through successful military service and command where you sort of get the benefit of being known. You also get the benefit of uh, everything that goes with the respect for the American military, which is still generally a, a broadly held respect. 
Uh, if you're someone who's risen to the rank of general, you obviously have some organizational skills, some leadership skills that are there. It's like this natural way we were talking about after the first Gulf War, Norman Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell. They're, they're, right. they're being talked about as being candidates. It'd be a good, another good, uh, a good fork in time. What if Powell had run in '96? Right. Uh, you know. So, so this, so it's not, it's not way out at all by any stretch of the imagination no. to imagine a surviving, living. <laughs> George Patton in 1945 or 46 or certainly by 48 is the type of person that type of person that folks are approaching and saying, "Hey, we want you to run and here's one." Well, yeah, he's got all the war hero or, you know, build up behind him, but he's also the things that he said that got him in trouble back then have proven to be right. Right. So he looks like he was thinking bigger and and more correctly than the powers, you know, that be. We haven't even talked about one other big thing that's going on in the international stage because it's not going on in Europe. It's not going on in the United States. Uh, there's mm. this big country in Asia, uh, Ch China. That's who it is. Things are not exactly all uh, all. Uh, yeah, the the Chinese Civil War, which I'm not sure when it started. It's like 21, I think, or 22. It's way back. Uh, and and they they have an interesting history there. The, the communists are coming to power in China. Or they're trying to come to power. They're being uh, opposed, um, and both parties like put the war, uh, put their civil war on hold because of World War Two, and to Japanese unite aggression. and fight against the Japanese who invade them. And um, now that the war is over, they've turned back to fighting each other. And um, yeah, for for the Truman Doctrine to be in place in forty seven, and us not help China is kind of a big gap of policy there, you know, consistency. Why aren't we jumping in on the side opposing Ch the, the communists and, and Mao uh, in 1947? Um, the type certainly of, something Patton would probably take a look at. For example, a 48 election campaign, the debates in the 48 election campaign could very much, let's say it's... I guess I, a question, we didn't even talk about this before. We assume that Patton runs as a... Well, more than likely, he's going to run as a Republican. Only because it dis differentiates himself from Truman, who, of course, is running for, I'd to say, re-election. But it's not re-election, it's election for the first time as right. president. Right. He, he's the sitting president, but not an elected president. And uh, he will be running as the incumbent, but an unelected incumbent uh, as a Democrat. in 48. As a Democrat. Yeah. So probably as a Republican. Now, his Republican challenger in 48... Is going to be Thomas Dewey. Dewey ran in '44 as the sacrificial lamb sort of candidate. Uh, they knew that in '44 he wasn't going to unseat Roosevelt in a time of war when things were looking like they were turning positive, you know. But they, you know, he ran. He got very little, yeah. but uh, I think he got southern states only. It, it, it was very, very I, I, I recently looked at the electoral map, and it, it reminds you again of the power of the electoral college in terms of yes. where the votes were. And it, it was a landslide elect in the electoral college, which is also why you have the uh, Dewey defeats Truman. Uh, the, the headline, the headline. Is, is the fact that you know they didn't quite grasp the understanding of exactly how this process works, either from polling, which I have an interest in because well, of my degree in political science and what's wrong. If, if you do a telephone poll in 1948, you have a skewed sample right off the bat, <laughs> which is part of what they did. Right. And then the other part being not understanding that it's not just where the votes, who it's where the votes are that also matter when it comes to presidential electoral it politics does. in the United States. And of course the time, because back then the press, the, the, pre, the paper had to go to press so much earlier right. that you couldn't wait that late to, to do it. So they had to flip a coin. And it was a very close to call uh, election because um, at the time President Truman was unpopular. You know, he he had like less than fifty percent approval rate, and so many people felt Dewey was going to win, and he ended up losing. Dewey, uh, for those that don't know, he was the governor of New York. Uh, he had come to to fame. Uh, as a prosecutor who prosecuted Lucky Luciano. And um, oddly, he later gets uh, associated, I guess, when he's governor, uh, as being involved in the 
the parole of Luciano and his deportation. And so many of his critics were saying that he had gone soft on the crime. After, <laughs> after being this, you know, crusader against organized crime, he moved up a level and went soft. Uh, so he had that against him, but that, that's kind of his claim to fame. Um, but, but, but I don't think anybody anywhere has ever said, Thomas Dewey, now that's, that's a charismatic candidate there, man. Well, and not only that, but in 1944, <laughs> when, he did, when he was running as the Republican uh, nominee, he made a point of like not sticking his neck out. He ran a super middle of the road, let's not take a stand on anything so that we don't offend anybody. I think he'd be the perfect candidate in 2020, right? He'd say nothing that would offend anybody. Um, but ultimately, he didn't get enough support because he didn't, nobody could really nail him down for what he stood for. Not the problem with Patton. I'm sure Patton would have run a very boisterous campaign. Um, he would have been hard against the, uh, the Soviets. The issues that were really big at that time were the Chinese Civil War, whether or not in America was basically going to take on its shoulders this, this role of world policeman, that term actually gets coined during this time period. Are we the policemen for the world? Um, the unification of Germany was an issue. Um, how, how was it going to go? Um, and of course, the spread of communism sort of overshadows everything. And on this Patton would be the best candidate probably imaginable. Uh, he had always been railing against it. He was a proven military leader. He knew what it took to you know, stop evil forces, as it were. So I think <clears throat> this, can this topic works really well and gets him a lot of votes that Dewey would have never had a chance to get and that Truman shouldn't have gotten because... He was kind of weak toward the Soviets. At a bare minimum, you can certainly imagine, even if he had not obtained, we'll assume here, the, Dem the Republican nomination, although I guess there is a scenario you could see him running as an independent, challenging the whole, the whole system, sort of that outsider challenging type of thing. Tougher to do back in that day than it is, than it is today, or even as tough to do today. But certainly you would have seen him as a, as a Republican candidate in the primaries, and what would be leading, even if he didn't win the nomination, he would have been influencing the party's position, the platform, and what the dialogue would have been around the election. I'm actually, I'm actually more confident that he could have gotten the nomination than I am, and that he could win the election, <laughs> um, <clears throat> simply because uh, Dewey lost an election already. So there's that perception of he's a loser. Americans like winners. Um, he wasn't willing to like really stick his neck out and make a, a strong statement of anything. So it's hard for someone to say this is what he stands for. Uh, Patton, I think, was a known commodity. And, you know, love him or hate him, you knew what, you're you, getting. <laughs> you knew what he was saying and what he was about. Um, there, you know, interestingly, you mentioned third parties. There were two other third parties in the, or in the uh, can you say two other third parties? <laughs> Yeah, two yeah. other alternate parties. Yeah, they, they, they were third parties. You just, didn't, you just didn't know who was third and who was fourth until you actually run the run the election, right? But yeah, because of the former fired vice president uh, Henry Wallace uh, had gotten the nomination of the Progressive Party, which were, uh, if they were around today, certainly Bernie Sanders would probably be their man. And uh, then uh, because Truman had been been passing all this civil rights legislation and, and enacting things, there was sort of a backlash with Southern Democrats and you had the formation of what was called the Dixiecrat Party, uh, led by the then governor uh, Strom Thurmond of South Carolina. Uh, later and, senator forever from South Carolina. Yeah, later <laughs> senator forever. Was he like a hundred when he, and he still in he, office? If he wasn't, like he was that? he was really close to it. He was yeah around forever. Um, so yeah, these two parties pulled um, roughly five percent of the vote combined. Uh, I don't I don't know that that Patton would have uh, pulled much away from them. Certainly not the progressives. Maybe some of the Dixocrat votes would have gone his way. But um, I, I think he had a, he would have a really good shot at winning against Truman. It's always hard to unseat a, a sitting president. 
But um, assuming he does. Okay, so so now we have, assuming that's the outcome, we have President yeah. we have President Patton taking the oath, oath of office in January of 1949. January 1949. So, um, it's obvious that during the war that that they they bugged. Patton's office, the U.S. government did, to hear what he had to say. Wilcox says in his book, uh, it was not long before the wiretappers heard their subject expressing violently anti-Russian views and even suggesting that ex-members of the Wehrmacht, which is the uh, German army, should be rearmed and used to help the U.S. army force the Red Army back into Russia in one uh, conversation uh, with Ike's deputy, McNarney, uh, he allegedly went as far to say, this is Patton, in 10 days I can have enough incidents happen to have us at war with those sons of bitches and make it look like it was their fault. Yeah, so this idea of what we think of as the Cold War turning hot was certainly well, within, the, within the realm of what would have been there. Certainly, but what what really strikes me is that last part of the quote there. We, we, we hear conspiracy theories, especially on the internet, all the time about false flags. That's what he's suggesting right here. Uh, you know, we know now that Hitler did that, that Hitler had sent uh, German commandos into Poland dressed in Polish army uniforms and then brought them back across the border and attacked German a German radio station and use that as his Probably you know ca- excuse right, yeah justification. to go in and that's exactly what Patton is is proposing here that you know give him 10 days and he can have so many things happen that the Russians will look like the bad guys and we'll have to be at war so with that in mind what kind of power does he have to do that as president now one of the things uh, I think that would prevent him from doing that where he would like to do it, which would be in Germany, is the fact that we have really stood down. In three years, our forces in Europe have been reduced a lot. We've shifted everything to reconstruction, less about you know military strength and fighting forces. So I don't see him getting the political will to reverse that. However... The, the the scenario is perfect with the Truman Doctrine in place, the Civil War in China coming to a close with Mao winning, but it's not over yet. It could be the perfect urgent point for Patton to using the Truman Doctrine to get us to fight communism in China. And I see that the cold the Cold War wouldn't have been cold for, for very long. We would have been in China uh, fighting the Chinese communists alongside the the were they Republican Chinese like the, the Republic of China um, and of course Patton now can't lead the army he would be very disappointed by that I'm, I think but but is there a candidate out there 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 is there's this Douglas MacArthur guy who knows the Asian area really well and um, is seems poised for it, and and like Patton, MacArthur's a, a taking care of business kind of general, and like Patton, he's also very egotistical. So he would jump at the chance to lead the army into China, uh, and the scary part now to this alternate history is that later on in real history, when MacArthur is in Korea under Truman. Uh, they get into trouble because he, like Patton did before him, did things without permission. But one of the things he kept begging for permission to do was use atomic weapons in, in the Korean Peninsula. So now imagine Pat, uh, Patton in the White House, MacArthur fighting communists in China, asking to use the bomb. And I think he probably would have gotten permission. Yeah, it's it. it yeah, you know, I think it's an interesting thing to me as I think back on that now. We, we think back now and we immediately, of of course, after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, what the bomb represented, 
but if you had been in combat and you had seen regular firebombing, like what happened in Dresden, or just Dresden, seen the, yes. or just seen the normal, just horrors. War is horrible, just as war. Whether whether it's an atomic war or not, you know, it's easy to look back for us. Again, I'm, I'm born in the '60s, so I, I look back through that prism of what I've known and the Cold War of just thinking, well, there's no way in the world we would have gone nuclear in an exchange, except to say that if you had seen conventional warfare and seen what was going on, and at that time. You still are at least the only kids on the block that have this particular weapon. For sure, that's operational. Do you consider using it? Because you actually think of it as being in much the same way that Truman made the decision for the dropping of the bombs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is that it's this or it's a million men dying in landings on the beach if we do a full-scale regular invasion. So you're thinking about it might have been... We look back on that now, there's no possible way that would have been done. Well, it was a different time, a different mindset... And people that actually experienced coming fresh out of the horrors of a war who maybe thought about it differently than those of us that are detached from it who are thinking about it just theoretically right. think about it. Well, and we were the only kids on the block with the big stick. Um, the, certainly the Soviets were getting close. They would get their bomb in 49. Um, but in the beginning of 49, we still were the only ones with it. And I think that the Soviets would be reluctant to jump in and help the Chinese. Uh, I don't think that they would want the, to possibly open another European war. Uh, and so I think we, we had a short window of opportunity there, as horrific as it is, to be the nuclear warmongering nation that we sometimes get accused of being uh, and get by with it. Because... The only other person, the only other country that had capability, I think, would be very reluctant to, to use it. And again, we talked about this a little bit before we began recording. While they were both communists, and at various points they obviously have cooperated in the 20th century, 21st century, it's not exactly like the Soviets and the Chinese saw the world through the same optics, even though they... They shared a philosophy. They shared a slightly different variant of that philosophy. Yes. And they sh and they shared different ideas about the geopolitics associated with that philosophy. Yeah, it's actually been said that that China and the Soviet Union were not even as friendly as we were with right. the Soviet Union during the during the World War II when we were allies. So, you know, and and certainly they had more in common than we did. Um, but mostly it was just the political, economic kind of thing. So in my alternate history, I, I see a hot war against communism in China. Now, what effect is, would that maybe have on the rest of, of history if you do the dominoes there? If China doesn't fall to communism, um, then maybe there's no Korean War. Uh, maybe there's... You know, we already have um, the Ho Chi Minh in, in in Korea, but maybe he doesn't want to be bombed by the, yes. the big bully Americans. So, so no Korea, no it's Vietnam, no Vietnam War, no 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 you know atrocities in Cambodia. All the things that are going on geopolitically in the uh, in the in Southeast Asia, right? Where the French are still a player, by the way. Right in at this at this point, yeah, they're, they're totally there. We're not even concern but um you know the, the things things change you know it's that that ripple effect that you talk about you know the if we could stop communism from taking china then the whole asian history of the last 60 years 70 years changes right and then i guess you know the thing that i was thinking through there is okay look, again carrying that assumption forward there's whether the bomb, whether the bomb, the atomic bomb gets used there, or whether it's just conventional forces that change things, you argue, argue to the extent that which we would have prosecuted the war, but right. we would have prosecuted a war if we got involved there with with able commanders. Nobody ever doubted MacArthur's ability to actually command in the field. So, and technologically, of course, we were far superior to anything China had. Right. So, um, in, in, under time. that scenario, there's there's that different thing there. So then, you know, what is the ripple back to Europe? in terms of how things are thought now in this divided iron curtain uh europe you know it may is there a concern well you know he, he dropped it there if things go hot here is he willing to drop it here is he willing to to restart the war remobilize now you have maybe a mobilized force that's successful in china 
you now have an army again. You what have do you, an army again. Where do you take it, right? And President Patton, who doesn't like the Soviet Union, you know, it might have he might have pushed for regime change. That's the the new term right. for it, right? Right. <laughs> regime change and nation building. Those are those are two. Uh, <laughs> Late 20th and early 21st right. century euphemisms for what history has done throughout, throughout history. history yeah. yeah, which is <laughs> which is victors putting the people in power they want to put in power and and sometimes choosing to engage in the conflict in the first place because they want somebody different to be in power. Yeah. So now my other my other sort of alternate is that he doesn't run in 48, and this one see comes to the same conclusion though. Say what if he runs in 52, took Eisenhower to 52 to to get pushed into running. What if Patton comes home, writes his memoirs, takes a little time, sees what happens, sees, you know, the fall of China and the Soviets getting the bomb and all these things and decides enough is enough and he's going to run instead of Eisenhower as a Republican. Uh, again, I see him probably winning. Um, only then we're already engaged in a war in Asia. Um, probably willing to use the bomb to stop the Chinese from, from what they were doing in, in Korea. Um, MacArthur's already been relieved at that point. I don't know if there'd be a reinstatement or he would probably find somebody else to, to step up. But the players may be different. The outcome, I think, would be very similar. Yeah, and, and the slight difference there also now in 52 or after 52, the Soviets have demonstrated that they have the weapons. They do well. have it. So now the, 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 the danger of going, of going to a hot war that ends up being nuclear hot is the risk that maybe the Soviets take a different stance on that and, and they, can bring a different, they can bring a different stick to the game. They can. They've had three years now with the bomb. Um, I don't know what their stockpile numbers, I don't know if anybody knows, were at that time, but certainly they had capability. Um, I don't know that they would want to use it, though, once again, the same argument's still there for China's sake, um, you know, to back, you know, would they, would they bomb South Korea, for instance, to, to support the Chinese? Uh, or would they, to deter us from doing anything else, bomb West Germany? I, I don't see them opening that can of worms. I think at that point that it, it's still too fragile. Yeah, and, and there's also that, you know, later, of course, I'm, I'm a child of, of the late 20th century, where the concept was mutual assured destruct, destruction. The arsenals are right. so big that if you let the genie out of the bottle, the risk right. exists that, 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 that every, everything's gone because it's not just, there's no such thing as a, conceptually, there's no such thing as a limited nuclear war. We may still be in the period of time in the late 40s and the early 50s where that concept still had some maybe military cachet and still could have had some political cachet as well. The idea that you can you can still, the United States exercised a limited nuclear war in World War II. Limited yes. because, because they were the only ones that had the weapon. And you're also talking about a very small weapon in comparison to our modern capabilities. Right, right. So, uh, in fact, we probably have tactical weapons, not what are called tactical that do what that strategic bomb did at that time. Yeah, and, and of course, I've heard, you know, just describing, I mentioned it earlier, the, the, the conventional bombing of a German city. In this case, right, Dresden, you don't even need... Dresden, I mean, you, the, the amount of destruction there, I, I've seen statistics and seen sort of, you know, things written Pictures about that. And yeah, that are, that are like, this was just, I mean, yes, not the, not the radiation devastation that is the what goes with that, but in terms of just... Loss of human life, horrific destruction. W yeah. w w war is hell. There's a reason we call it that, and it, whether it's a conventional weapon or an atomic weapon, that's still the outcome that's there. But I think there is, you know, it's tough for us maybe to look back on this because the way we look at it now. But there was the idea again of a limited nuclear option or a there was a tact a tactical use of nuclear weapons that didn't necessarily need to turn strategic, even though it was being used tactically for a strategic. Well, and, and honestly, there always has been. Uh, Clancy talks about this um, in his novels, and I've seen him in interviews, that there's always been a military doctrine for limited use of you know tactical nuclear weapons. Um, back then, though, that would have just been limited by stockpiles. I mean, there, we didn't have that many to use. They don't have as many as we did. So, you know, we couldn't have annihilated the whole world. And a new, a new atomic bomb aren't ro rolling off the assembly line left right. and right, yeah. By the end of that decade, however, 
we are in that situation and the thought of you know nuclear attacks on China or the Soviet Union would be you know right awful and like, then the, and the other thing that the be. other thing that alters you know giving the, the actually uh, the, the coming month in July uh, of 2019 which is next month as we're recording the podcast here that's part of what so much of what the space race was about the idea oh, of course the idea that now you have the you have these these missiles and rockets that are capable of not just delivering these these weapons where you have to get an airplane close enough to drop or an artillery shell close enough to fire at a distance, but you can do this from across the globe or from some distance away, and that also changed the calculus and changed the equation. Absolutely. That's why the space race was so important, was this idea of, oh, now it's, okay, they, you can put a little ball that beeps in space. In the case of Sputnik, that little ball that beeps could just as easily be a nuclear warhead. Well, that's what did it right there. Sputnik was the the ignition of, of the you know, intercontinental ballistic missile race. Right. Because, you know, you could see it. It was in low enough orbit that you could see it with the naked eye, and that scared everybody. Right, and, and changed the calculus there. Yeah. So, again, uh, we go through that whole exercise to say, you look back and say, well, of course we would have never gone nuclear in any of these. Well, that, that was a different time with a different set of thoughts without the constraints that we think of as being the logical reasons why we... That's such an extreme option today. It is an extreme option then, but it's even more extreme option today for all the reasons it's more extreme right. today. And so we put a modern sensibility back on that decision that wasn't a constraining factor necessarily of that decision at the time. And it's interesting to think, in my mind, it's interesting to think through from that. The other thing I was thinking about also was it, this gets lost in the shuffle unless you're a student of it. What was going on in Middle Eastern politics during the period of time here? You mentioned uh, the, found, the, modern found, the founding of the modern nation of Israel, uh, the, what's going on in Egypt, what's going on with the Suez. Uh, it, it, we forget, I mentioned the French well, earlier, we, we forget the French were actually a player in a lot of these geopolitical things uh, at this time as well. So it wasn't just even a simple U.S.-Soviet situation. There was also still a colonial power, the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. There was still a colonial well, power in the terms French, of France, yeah. who is still defending its interests globally. That's the other part of the equation that's going on here. Yeah, And with the, with the um, establishment of Israel, um, many people have, have pointed out that Patton was an anti-Semite. And there's not a lot of evidence to that, but they point to the fact that he was objecting to one of the things that happened under his when he, he was the governor of, of Bavaria um, was that the American policy was to give abandoned homes to the refugees from the Jewish refugees from the camps. Well, Patton didn't see any reason why only the Jewish refugees got it. And he was putting other people like the Catholics that were there and the, the gypsies and the, you know, whatever. But he, uh, he got in trouble for that as well, and he spoke out. So because he spoke out against that only the Jews get the homes and everybody else has to fend for themselves, uh, he got labeled anti, uh, as an anti-Semite, uh, fairly or not. Uh, there's not a lot of evidence that he like spoke against Jews, but how he would have taken to the nation of of Israel, I don't know. Right. Uh, then the other thing that this I hadn't even thought about this, but this has prompted me to think, which is what the whole purpose of the podcast <laughs> is, is to start thinking. So, so imagine the '52 Patton election. Mm -hmm. So President Patton takes office in '53. Uh, my memory serves correctly, Sputnik is 57, I think that's the date on that. I think so that. too, yeah. So let's assume that there's a re-elected patent, regardless of what these other things might have 56, happened, would have been okay. in 56. And so now, sitting in the Oval Office at the time, there's a the space race, as we think of it, launches, or there's a question about what's going to happen with space. Uh, one George S. Patton is sitting there in the Oval Office, realizing that the game has changed. The game has changed in a big way. Do you just? I know I'm asking this off the top of your head. How, how does a George Patton respond to the fact that there's a there's a there's a there's a there's a Soviet object orbiting around around the world? And a, there, there's a communist ball in space. I think it's probably the way that he would have thought about it. Not to say that he wouldn't have thought about it more in a more sophisticated way than that. Well, he was not necessarily a sophisticated man. Um, the, there's. You know, he has history of academic issues when he was younger, have, had a hard time learning, had a hard time learning to read, like started his former formal education at 11. Most kids are getting 
started way earlier than 11. Uh, today, uh, historians kind of think he was dyslexic. Despite that, and maybe his more, you know, what we would maybe say a blue-collar nature, he was always one with an eye for what something could do, the possibilities. Uh, you know, we mentioned that he, earlier, he uh, designed a saber that became the standard saber for our cavalry. He was the first to use the automobile when necessary in combat. He spearheaded the development of tank warfare for the United States. Um, I think he would have adapted real well to that situation. I think he would have seen seen it for what it was and responded, you know, I can see him saying we need one bigger. <laughs> if that's what they've got up there, ours needs to be bigger. Where is it? Right. And, and, and if you then lay that against... Maybe that does not happen because the Soviets are engaged in other ways because of the other events Maybe. that we've talked about. So the course of history that we know it has changed in a way we haven't even thought about, that there's no Russian space program because the Russians, the Soviets, are so busy dealing with uh, conventional arms, the conventional conflicts that maybe happen in a patent administration. That's one possibility. Possibly. Or even if they aren't, uh, then, you know, again, the backdrop might be now we're engaged in this global, not just Cold War, we're engaged in this uh -huh. global... Uh, World War Three. Uh, yeah, we're, and, and occasionally warming up kind of war in these various theaters of operations, which means the response back to, from the United States to the Soviet space program could easily be more of a military response versus what it really became in a lot of ways for the United States was it became, yes, it had a military implication about it. There's no doubt about that. That was recognized by President Eisenhower, right. recognized by President Kennedy. Everybody got that. But there was also this civilian response back to, the push is not to build a, a big enough rocket that can rain down atomic weapons on Moscow, uh, even though that's an indirect result of having that rocket right. and, and ICBMs that come into being, but it really becomes when well, we're going to beat them to the moon because we don't, want a, we don't want a red moon. We don't want the Soviets to have the ultimate high ground in terms of what we're thinking about here. So it, it had a military, nationalistic kind of response in, in the real, real timeline of history, but how that might have been altered a little bit more if the backdrop behind the context behind that is much more the thing of we've got to be doing this because militarily we can't afford to can't fall behind. Right, right. Uh, no, I agree. I, I see Patton probably pushing in that direction. Yeah, and, and so, you know, the, the 1960 election in, in the real timeline, uh, just, there's a discussion about the quote-unquote bomber gap or missile gap. Missile gap. Uh, you know, is that is, is that is that discussion <laughs> well before the 1960 election already taking place because of what's happening or what, again, what has happened, what happened with, uh, you know, the, That's the, interesting. The nuke, yeah. that, the nuke that we dropped in '53 in Korea, for example, has right. now changed the changed the mindset of what's out there. Now suddenly realizing, oh, now there are technology capable of delivering that payload everywhere. Everywhere, you know, there, there's no place on the world that's theoretically safe from the delivery of this payload, and how that changes things moving forward. So. You know, we might have a different, you know, the moon landing happens maybe, it may not be a moon landing, it may have pushed for more of a militarization of space, satellite technology or other things as well, mm -hmm. or you may have a 1964 moon landing because <laughs> it gets kicked off, not it's waiting. It's much more intensive. Yeah, yes. and, and, and much more focused, not saying that the Apollo program was not focused, but it took a long time for the momentum to come along to make that happen, and right. then a big goal that was laid out to make it a reality before the end of the 1960s. Yeah, it's, it's, that's another whole topic, but it's interesting how the, the space program really began as a way of, of countering militarily on paper, but it, it really captured the imagination of the public in a totally civilian propaganda sort of way, and, and then it spread worldwide. I mean, supposedly it was the most watched thing right. ever on TV. And, right. Probably even to this day, even with the capability of TV stretch being, you know, the, the uh, I forget, the, a share, I guess, with the, of all the TVs that are on, that's what they call a share right, versus right. a rating. It had a very high share. Very high I share. don't know what else was on any other network. I don't think there was because there was a limited choice. We didn't live in a 500 channel <laughs> universe then, but yeah, uh, th th there, there, there was no counter programming. Figure skating was not being shown anywhere, for example, opposite a sporting event, right. trying to find a different audience. Everybody <laughs> was focused on this for the reasons they were focused on it. I think it's an interesting way to play that out because um, I think it also sets that background of my take on American history is that we think of ourselves as 
having fought this war, World War II being the war we're talking about here, and then Korea and Vietnam being this as well, reluctantly fighting because we needed to defend freedom and halt the spread of, of tyranny in whatever form you wanted to look at it being in, and, and that we did not think of ourselves as being a military nation or a na it, we're a reluctant military well, power it's for, a, versus a different backdrop where you've been more engaged in conflict where you are well, by necessity a military power. By tradition, America has always, well, until recent years maybe, said that we never start a war. We aren't the ones to go in and start something. Um, I think Patton was very much opposed to that. Uh, he would say things like, you never win a war by defense, right? You win by offense, by attacking the enemy, not by sitting back and holding ground. And yet, you know, we did, for most of the Cold War, just fight defensively. We we didn't aggressively go to stop anybody. And, I, you know, looking back, you might even say strategically that was part of the problem with Vietnam was, you know, we were too passive with it. We, we didn't commit fully. We only committed partially. And There's this extended comment we were talking about earlier about you know limited war. There's this idea of is, is there such thing as limited war? That really is a, in some ways that's a 20th century invention. Once you have the ability to go beyond certain points, I mean war was limited by technology moving back in right. time. But once you have the ability of you know putting you, rules to it and laws to it and right, you know. and, and that changes with World War One in many ways, and then it changes in World War Two and <clears> then subsequent wars, guerrilla warfare, all the things that we know as being warfare in the last century more or less you know fits this category but this idea of limited war i think is an interesting thing to think about you know this is all about what well, how things would be different with a patent right exactly because i was just sitting here thinking patent i don't think would feel that way now he was he was an honorable guy even his opponents would talk about his honor and his loyalty and all of that but he was definitely uh you know go all out, you're all in, you don't hold nothing back. When you're fighting, you're fighting. You, you're killing as many of them as you can before they kill you. Um, in fact, I, th I think about, we were talking about that, that speech from the, the, what's running through my head now is that speech from the opening thing of Patton when it says, your job is not to die for your country, it's to make the other guy die for, for his. his. Yes. Uh, it sort of explains a lot of it, and that's pulled directly from, from a speech that yep. he gave. That you, you, get a, you get an insight into what his thoughts were on how how conflict should be. If you're going to engage in conflict, engage in conflict, which I think is to your point, which is a, a president, you can't imagine a president, you can imagine a president patent that may have been mitigated or moderated a little bit by being in the office. By, and by means, because you know we weren't at war, we weren't in full war production. But, but, if but he he's still himself. Right, yeah. if, and if he makes the decision <laughs> to commit, what he's going to commit to is going to be very different than you certainly may have seen under a Truman or under... And Eisenhower, and again, both of those men served in, and, in in war and understood what it was. They just had a different maybe take than Patton would have had about what you do. Right, and and I think and I think they had a very different understanding about it because you're you know Ike toured battlegrounds after they were fought. Uh, he wasn't there watching people get blown up and ripped apart, and you know having to send people to hold. Uh, a flank while everybody else else left, knowing those people you're telling this to are, are probably going to die. He didn't have to do those things. He did other things which were probably difficult as well, but different perspective on the war. Right. And that's why I feel uh, confident that you know out of all the presidents since Truman um, that could drop a, a nuclear weapon, it, if we had a President Patton, it would have probably been him. Probably been him. I agree with that. And uh, it's, it's been interesting to think about him in that role, and you know, uh, and then you, you, then that doesn't even get into what is the domestic policies of a president, Pat, and even right. life, which are oh. which are probably a whole other thing we could spend a whole other podcast talking about because I'm sure he had some ideas there too. Well, I was uh, I was you know doing research because I read the book that got me interested, and uh, that's why I mentioned it to you. But then when I agreed to come on, I started doing a little more research, a little more digging, and it's weird how apparently, and I wasn't alive back then, maybe some of your listeners can you know, comment, um, it seemed like everything, even on the domestic side, aside from civil rights, everything was about communism, even in, in, in our, you know, stopping it even here at home. Um, it, it was just the paramount issue of the day.
Um, there wasn't a lot of division. You know, he certainly didn't have people hollering for like universal health care and things like that uh, in the 1940s. It was, you know, we were in an economic prosperous kind of time period. And so people could turn to things like civil rights and um, worrying about whether or not we were going to become communist. Right. I think um, another interesting thing there, too, and I, I, I readily admit that I haven't done research on, you know, where a, a President Patton would have come down on civil rights right. issues. But what I do know this, this is true across the board. Um, and thinking back to the experience of African-Americans in World War II, in many instances, those that fought side by side regardless of color, the color of skin, had a very different mindset and thought about about those races and those people just because they had the experience of that. I mean, I know in particular, yes. for example, one of the things that did happen in 1944, late 1944, the Battle of the Bulge, where, yes, the, the U.S. And, and the Allies have been successful in the Normandy landings and they're pushing across Europe, but they hit this little roadblock with a counteroffensive around around Christmas time in, in 1944, and things are such that um, at that time a decision is made to actually uh, actually take uh, black troops into combat that had not been in combat before out of necessity. And I can't help but think that one of the guys who's in charge of that operation who's having success in relieving the pressure on Bastogne and the situation that happens in the Battle of the Bulge is one George S. Patton. Right. And so, you know, I, I don't know enough to, to speak definitively either way, but I can imagine a scenario where someone like a Patton, again, not afraid to say his mind, says, this is ridiculous. It's the 1950s. It's the late 1940s. It's the 1950s. Why are we still doing this as a country and having an ex a very different discussion or debate that would happen on the social side of a presidency? Right. I would like to say that, that he would probably be a fairly socially liberal uh, president or leader, uh, judging from the way he treated the Nazis. Once again, if a man can do a job, who cares, right? He needs to do the job. The one thing, though, I think that divides that issue from the home issue is that of color. Um, the way black and white relations were in the 1940s and even continue to be today is unique right. in, in the world. So, you know, I'd like to say that, yeah, he probably would. And he was from California, so, you know, maybe he would tend to be a little more open-minded about things. You know, we tend to think Californians are all open-minded. Although, you know, Reagan was also, right? <laughs> right. Uh, but anyway, um, I think I think Patton would have been fair. Um, and what is fair might not be what everybody wants to hear. You know, he, Truman said a lot of racist things as president. And he certainly didn't personally, from what he says, what he's been recorded as saying believe that the races were equal. But he desegregated the military. But he did a lot of civil rights legislation. And, and you can look back and say, well, it wasn't much. At the time, it was. I mean, it didn't. you can't just take a big eraser and fix that issue in America, or we wouldn't still be living with it today. Right. Um, he got some, he pushed the ball a certain distance. I, I would tend to think Patton would at least do the same. Right. And I, I think it's one of those, you know, it's tough to know. You mentioned earlier, I like to think of the ad, the adage of the rock and the ripples. It's tough to know if things change from a foreign policy standpoint or the focus is different there. How does that, does that, it may not change at all what's going on with domestic policy or it may have unintended consequences coming back to domestic policy that you can't even imagine. For example, if there had been a need for a larger scale U.S. military um the way that a draft might have worked, which could work both way, you know, work both ways, or how th you, how how just things can play out in ways you don't imagine. There's always unintended consequences, and there so are. it's tough to know. You know, it, it's easy. Well, the, the linear thinking is A then B then C. It's A and B and C. But what this D thing popped up here right. down because of that that we hadn't even thought about, and yes. I think there's the possibility of that existing in a patent presidency. Uh, I also can't help but think of the number of times that uh, American presidencies have been hijacked by events that they had no, that they were not even of their own making. Right. And so, you know, it's easy, this always happens, and this is the difficulty of the what if, it's the difficulty of the counterfactual, is we assume that a lot of other variables would remain. Are remain the same. Remain the same. Well, when we, in, when we in just, fact, probably none of them would. Yeah, we just <laughs> tweak a couple of these things and see how that would impact there. But, you know, what happens if suddenly, because of the flow of things,
uh, a patent presidency finds itself in response to something that that the real timeline never saw itself in response to. For me, uh, regardless of what you think or where you are politically in the United States, you can agree with this fact that uh, uh, George W. Bush's presidency was hijacked, was, yes. was hijacked or altered <laughs> by the events of 9-11. Uh, what, what, how you view that, whatever your view is on that. I remember very clearly the thing he wanted to do in, in 2001 was pass that, pass that initiative that gave... Uh, faith-based organizations equal claim to federal money for doing charitable work. And that just went away after yeah. 9-11. It was like poof. Because, because the entire focus was different. And, you know, again... And never, never has come back to it. Right. <laughs> it, 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 and again, regardless of whether you think he was a good president, it doesn't matter. You, what you can't deny is the fact that the course of his presidency was, um, was impacted by an external event and then being forced to react to that external event and then the things that flow from that. And so, you know, what's always the tough part for me in these hypotheticals is, okay, we can, again, assume all these other things stay constant, but the wild card is what happens if, and then you have a different character in the office and maybe a different response. Well, and then I can throw that out there. I can throw you another little side maybe. Um, what would have changed if President Patton is in office? There's still those people that want him dead bringing it back to the assassination theory. So maybe it's not in Dallas and Daly Plaza, but... Maybe it's Patton in, you know, Sacramento or something, you know? <laughs> and if somebody was going to die in California, my best guess is Sacramento is probably the place <laughs> where it would have happened. And I think that's an excellent point. Well, they is, didn't kill Reagan, yeah. so, you know. <laughs> is, is that we, we don't think through those, un, those also, those altering things that happen in history that, you know, the, the interesting thing there, it, it will definitely be a podcast topic. It was such the obvious podcast topic that we're not doing it, It'll definitely be the obvious podcast topic at some point of what happens if there's no Kennedy assassination. Kennedy assassination, sure. And uh, and you know that that that's been speculated on. Books have been written, all kinds of other things. Everybody from Stephen King to name anybody else has written on that. Mm -hmm. um, but again, those are the those are the instances where it's one small change in history. Again, your theory here is that you know he's he's in a car accident, maybe not of his own of right. his own doing. You know, a couple of people make a decision that leads to there not being the opportunity for President Patton. What could have happened on the other side of that? And again, that's sort of what, to me, is what this podcast is about. What's so interesting about it is we don't know what would have happened. It's all opinion. It's, it's all, all opinion speculation. speculation. Uh, but we try to bring our best intellect and our best understanding to the discussion to say, okay, what's not just what's possible, what's probable. And those are not the same things. And, and of course, then it's, you know, an election in 48 by 54, you know, at some point, maybe, I don't know, maybe at some point, the Giants don't win the pennant. You know, <laughs> there's some baseball impact for a reason I can't even fathom. Right. That this the happens. Butterfly effect, exactly. Right? That mm -hmm. happens there, and uh, there's some people somewhere. The Dodger, the Dodgers stay in Brooklyn for uh, imagine of all things. Mm -hmm. You get all these things that are, seem trivial, but they're all it's all connected the way it comes together. So Indeed. Good. Any other thoughts as we get ready to close out here, Dean? No, I, I find the whole. The whole activity fascinating. I do too, which which, which, is, fun. which is why I spend time doing it, and I hope that our listeners enjoy the time that they spend listening. So uh, uh, on behalf of Dean Rogers, yeah, appreciate I, you having me on. I appreciate you being here, Dean, and and, and I hope we, we, we. I know this this I know this episode is going to sponsor some response just because it's the type <laughs> of thing that does, and that's what this is all about. So as we close out, one of the things that I'll remind our listeners is if you visit our website, which is a forkendtimepodcast.com the A on the front end and the podcast on the back end are both, both very important but one of the things that we have there we actually actually have several different ways for you to provide feedback and we want that feedback if you love today's episode we want to know that if you hated today's episode come and leave that feedback too and tell us why uh, we have the forums that are there uh, the forums are, are, there's a topic every time in the forums for the particular episode that's in place. So there's a chance to go and comment, find other folks as we hopefully start building a following at the site who will intergage, inter, 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 intergage. That's, that's a new <laughs> word. I've created a new word, intergage. But we'll engage and, uh, and be part of an exchange that goes on uh, there that is ongoing. It's not just that we leave this and say, Dean has spoken, Don has spoken. This is what a patent presidency it. would have looked like. You probably have some different ideas and we want to hear those. So we welcome... Uh, the visit there to uh, to a fork in time podcast.com and there's the chance to do that through the forum through feedback there's the chance to also suggest topics there dean suggested this topic dean has an inside track because he's a personal friend 
but that doesn't mean that you don't have a topic that I would find equally compelling. And uh, so if you want to suggest a topic, there's a form there to do that. We'll get back with you, better understand what's going on. Uh, certainly the opportunity exists to connect with us on. My daughter would be very, very upset with me. I didn't mention because it's what she does in the real world, social media. So Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, Pinterest, you'll find all the links there again on a fork in time podcast.com. And then, of course, uh, the opportunity, if you've really enjoyed the podcast and want to participate as a patron, um, we're not in this to make money, but there are costs associated with having a podcast on, so it's an opportunity to participate in the show. We give some special uh, bonuses and some special perks uh, to our podcast patrons there. One of those is, if you suggest a topic, patrons have the opportunity to be invited to be a guest host. So one of the ways that you, you, you can bribe us to get on the air, I guess is what I'm saying, if you've got a good topic and a compelling way to do it. D didn't have to, Dean did do that. He brought me some Dr. Pepper before the episode hey. today. So uh, that's that's a whole other thing. Someday I'll talk about what if there'd never been a Dr. Pepper. <gasps> blasphemy. That, that would be blasphemy. <laughs> but for all those reasons, again, we encourage you not just to listen, which we think is part of the exercise. We know you're thinking, but give us feedback as well, and we have a lot of different ways for you to do that. So, again, we appreciate the gift that you've given us today, which is the gift of your time. We know that that's valuable, and you can be doing other things with it, so we thank you for it. And so, again, on behalf of Dean, on behalf of myself, and all of us that are involved with the Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast, we're going to bid you a good day and look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Join us next time.